Hey guys, what's up? Here's Max. Chapter 14 of Dragon Ball Hakai is already finished, and this chapter brings us a lot of content, such as the beginning of the end of a brutal combat, and also a very surprising revelation. But before I tell you this chapter, leave your like to help us. Your like is very important for this video, to have more reach and more people to know the story of Dragon Ball Hakai. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because by doing so, you will always know absolutely everything about Dragon Ball Hakai and many other things about the Dragon Ball franchise in general. Also share this video to your friends who are Dragon Ball fans, because more people will know Dragon Ball Hakai, and it will help keep the story going. The chapter that will be exposed in this video is now available on our website, dbhakai.com, as well as all the other chapters of the story. So go check it out after watching this video, and take the opportunity to take a look at the other content on our site. Now let's start with Chapter 14 of Dragon Ball Hakai. Stay connected in the channel, and let's go to the video. Hakai. Universe 7, Planet Earth. The planet's sky is completely covered by clouds, dominated by thunder and lightning. From the top of the big rock near his house, Piccolo watches all those weather anomalies, and in his line of sight can be seen a tornado too, which is probably one of many in the region. Piccolo flies away from there. Where is he going? Chapter 14, The Leader of the Celestial Mages is Revealed. In the highest region of planet Earth's sky is the floating celestial platform temple of the planet's god. Someone approaches the platform, cutting through the sky at high speed. It's Piccolo, who touches his foot on the platform just as Gohan arrives. As he arrives, Gohan greets his master, surprised that he is also there. Piccolo is equally surprised to see his disciple. So Dende called him? Noticing the two who have just arrived, Dende calls out to them, thanking them for heeding his call. Dende is accompanied by Majin Buu and also by Beerus. Watching those who are there with a suspicious expression, Gohan asks the God of Destruction what is happening and if his presence on Earth has anything to do with the climatic catastrophes that are taking place across the planet. Piccolo compliments with the comments saying that he senses a key very similar to Frieza's, but it's not. The conversation is interrupted when two people arrive at the scene with a teleporter. They reveal themselves to be Shin and Kibito. The Supreme Kai immediately addresses Beerus, asking if he already knows about Vegeta, and saying that they must stop him immediately. Gohan and Piccolo are surprised to hear Vegeta's name, surprised that he's involved in all of this. Responding to the Supreme Kai, Beerus refuses to get involved, saying that Vegeta is already all grown and doesn't need a babysitter. But Shin emphasizes the need to stop Vegeta, arguing that if this continues, the entire universe could be destroyed. Beerus stands firm in his decision, arguing that Vegeta is not an amateur and knows very well what he is doing. And he ends by saying that he has more important things to worry about right now. This is a little ironic since the God of Destruction's highest concern is supposed to be the universe, but it's okay. Very confused, curious, and probably worried about the whole situation, Gohan asks if Beerus can explain what is happening and why he is there. Beerus claims he doesn't like to repeat things, so he'll wait for the other Earth warriors to arrive to explain what's going on. Worried, Piccolo notes the strangeness in Beerus' actions and for him to be acting this way. It's because something very serious is happening. Discreetly putting aside his nonchalant demeanor, Beerus looks intently in one direction. What worries Universe 7's God of Destruction? Somewhere in space far away, planets Quinn. An intense battle takes place in the midst of a planet completely dominated by extremely intense climatic catastrophes. Vegeta is hit by a punch right in the face. The next second, seeing the enemy heading for his back, he turns to headbutt him in the face. While being knocked away by Vegeta's headbutt, Cooler launches a wave of energy which Vegeta dodges, then immediately counterattacks with a Hakai, which Cooler also dodges. After completely destroying the last two planets near the central planet with their energy attacks, Vegeta and Cooler return to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, with Cooler pressing down on his opponent and causing him to retreat amidst exchanging blows. Cooler needs to defend against the sequence of attacks from Vegeta, which interrupts the sequence of continuous blows for a stronger kick, such that Cooler defends with his own legs, but Vegeta used the low blow as a distraction for a higher blow. More specifically, a hard punch that targets the crack in the center of Cooler's chest which causes the Golden Demon a lot of pain. Vegeta takes advantage of Cooler's pain to continue attacking with non-stop punches, but receives a hard counter-attack. 
a strong punch to the stomach that causes him a lot of pain. After that, Vegeta begins to be hard pressed by Cooler, receiving multiple attacks from the opponent while precariously trying to defend himself with his arms. Vegeta closes his eyes in pain as he is punished by the opponent's blows until one moment he seems to feel something like great pain and then his consciousness seems to begin to decay, slowly closing his eyes until they are finally completely closed. Cooler fills with confidence, charging Vegeta for what may be his final blow. But Vegeta seems to wake up with a start and then he does something Cooler sure didn't expect. Upon landing a punch on Vegeta's Hakai, Cooler has his right arm completely destroyed. The golden demon howls in pain as reveals his partially destroyed body. After dealing this severe damage to his enemy, Vegeta confidently says that he will die. As he continues to agonize, Cooler stares at his foe, startled. Vegeta approaches the demon while grabbing his side horns, then uses Cooler's own horns as a support to hit him with a powerful headbutt, such that it is powerful enough to create a strong impact wave around him and also to crack Cooler's natural armor mask. While preparing the next attack, Vegeta tells Cooler to take off that mask. He wants to see his opponent's ugly face agonizing in pain. Vegeta hits the second headbutt, and this time, the pieces of Cooler's mask are scattered through the air. For the next moment, his face is revealed again. Unmasked, Cooler reveals an expression that combines pain and rage as his demonic blood flows from his mouth and his nose. Vegeta has a different expression, a crazed smile, saying that's what he likes to see. Take that, says the Prince of the Saiyans as he prepares another attack, which will apparently be the strongest of all, the ultimate attack. Vegeta directs his head with full force towards the opponent, ready for one last brutal attack. But... Unfortunately for Vegeta, his headbutt is interrupted by the index fingers of Cooler's last remaining arm, sticking into his eye, blinding the Saiyan warrior, who puts his hand to the injured eye while screaming in agony. You like what you're seeing, you bastard? Asks Cooler, an ironic line despite his notorious fury. The Golden Warrior bends his body, preparing a direct charge as he says, Then take a look at this! With his remaining eye, Vegeta watches with concern, what is to come? And then before he could react, the Prince of Saiyans had his abdomen pierced by Cooler's central horns, who charged at him like a bloodthirsty bull. Vegeta immediately reacts despite the pain, emanating his power in a way that generates enough force to knock Cooler back, who quickly falls to the ground. After pushing the opponent away, Vegeta vomits some of his own blood while feeling great pain, and then begins to fall from the sky while continuing to expel blood, also falling to the ground afterwards. Down, Cooler makes his remarks to his opponent criticizing his current transformation. You're an idiot. This transformation of yours can constantly give you more power, but in return, you have to put your body in constant damage, which makes your durability in battle much smaller. And there is a limit to how many attacks you can take. Vegeta also smiles, pointing out the hypocrisy of his opponent's judgment shortly after, also making his remarks about his transformation. Look who's talking. Do you think I didn't notice? Since you activated this new form, you've been losing energy very quickly. You said you didn't train that form much, did you? Something very similar happened to Frieza when he just acquired the Golden Transformation. The difference between you is that you managed to master the Golden Form well while you were in your regular appearance. But you couldn't adapt well to the power of the Golden Form added to this transformation. After listening to all of Vegeta's remarks, Cooler admits that he is right. Both have great weaknesses in the end. As he begins to struggle to his feet, he confirms Vegeta's suspicion as he makes a proposal to the Saiyan. This transformation consumes a lot of my energy, and I won't be able to maintain it much longer. On the other hand, your body also already seems to be very close to the limit. What do you say we decide this fight once and for all? I suggest a direct attack using all our remaining power. No tricks this time. Also starting to get up with a similar difficulty, Vegeta replies. No tricks, huh? It's hard to believe coming from Frieza's brother. On the other hand, it can't be easy for you to trust a Saiyan like me either. And looking at your face, you don't look good enough to cheat. Okay, looks good to me. No tricks this time. Making that deal, Vegeta and Cooler prepare for the final showdown, unleashing what's left of their powers. Meanwhile on Planet Chameleon, Universe 6, 
Faced with the enemy that appeared, Goku reveals that he doesn't understand why the enemy is still in that place. After all, it was Hiro's cocoon he wanted, right? Why didn't he just take the cocoon and leave? Odisu, the great mage of the elements and leader of the five great celestial mages, reveals that he didn't leave because he was waiting for him, the god of destruction, Son Goku. He wants Universe 6's deity to show him his power. But Kiboru, Supreme Kai's assistant, is against that idea. Hiro's cocoon is there, and if a fight breaks out, it could cause the power contained in the cocoon to cause unimaginable catastrophes. As he reaches into his pocket, Odisu states that this won't be a problem. The Celestial Mage takes a card out of his pocket, then jumps out of the cocoon, letting the spell card fall from his hand. Upon touching the cocoon, the card releases a magical light, while creating a rune below the cocoon. In the next second, the card, rune, and cocoon are completely gone. Supreme Kai is shocked by this. This damn thief has stolen the cocoon, but Goku isn't shocked, as his counterpart telling him, with a smile, that this isn't as bad as it sounds. At least now he can face this guy freely. If he can take down the leader, surely the Celestial Mages will have a great loss. Kiboru insists on his point, advising that they should back off, stating that this is a fight Goku cannot win. But the Saiyan Destroyer keeps his smile, saying he won't do this. He now has a more serious expression, asking Kiboru what kind of god he would be if he simply ran away from the one who wants to destroy his universe. The protagonist still says with determination that no matter how strong this guy is, he will defeat him. Liai, equally determined, agrees with her counterpart's attitude. They have to show this runaway, what happens to those who mess with the gods of this universe? Facing the enemy with a serious look, Goku says he doesn't like the idea of facing someone who hides his face. Why doesn't he stop being a coward and show his face? As he takes his hands to the hood that hides his face, Adisu decides that he will grant this wish to honor their courage. Meanwhile, in the Celestial Mage's hideout, Tyra screams announcing the idiocy of her companions. She does so by addressing Brajin and Tehran, who are also at the scene. She continues to scold her companions, saying she doesn't believe that among them all, she was the only one who fulfilled her mission, so far. Tehran justifies his failure by saying that Beerus appeared to stop him. If he started a fight against the Destroyer of Universe 7, it would have been much worse. Rajin also gives her justification, saying that the cocoon that contained the rest of Majin Buu's dormant power was taken by someone of the Angel Race. Fighting someone like him could wipe out what little beauty this gross body has. A magical rune appears at the location and inside that rune are two shadows. Rajin and Tehran look closely at those who arrive. It is the mage called Zorki and the primordial beast called Kalimor. This last one happily observes the fact that almost everyone is there. As Zorki approaches his three companions, Kalimor reveals that Zarat's memories bring him positive feelings about them. The four celestial mages present kneel before the primordial beast. Tyrus calls Zorki saying he should remove his hood to greet Lord Kalimor. While revealing his face, Zorki apologizes to Kalimor. It's just that he hates that face. But haven't we already seen that face somewhere? Kalimor smiles, apparently not caring if Zorki's face was covered or not. Goku, Liai, and Kiboru are very tense at the revelation of Odisu's face, who after revealing his appearance suggests that they take a look at his face, because that will be the last face they will see. Odisu, the leader of the five great celestial mages, finally reveals his face, and that is the same face of Anzen, the leader of the celestial guardians, who was defeated during the mage's release. Zorki, the grand mage of illusions, has also revealed his appearance, and he has the same face as the guardian, who was Anzen's assistant. What does that mean? Now that he has revealed his face, Odisu intends to eliminate Goku, Liai, and Kiboru. Will they be able to survive a confrontation with the leader of the Celestial Mages? Meanwhile, Vegeta and Cooler have reached the height of brutality in their fight. And now that both are very close to their limit, they will appeal for a final attack using all the power they have left. Who will be the victor in this intense fight? On Earth, Beerus asks Dende for some mysterious reason to gather all the warriors on the planet. What does the God of Destruction have to reveal to the Z warriors? Find out in the next chapters of Dragon Ball Hakai. And that was chapter 14 of Dragon Ball Hakai. As you can see, a lot has happened in this chapter, and we have had some very important revelations. 
Something that I think is worth mentioning to explain to you is the revelation of the identity of Zorki, the Great Mage of Illusions, and Odisu, the Great Mage of Elements. These revelations are very important to us to understand some things about the story, and perhaps some not very attentive people may not have understood the importance of this revelation. Well, in Chapter 8 of Dragon Ball Hakai, during a conversation between Beerus and Pycon, we find out that Taran, Beerus' master, who died many, many years ago, has become a celestial guardian. According to Pycon, Taran died during the attack the Guardians suffered, which is the same attack that happened in Chapter 1, where the leader of the Guardians named Anzen and another Guardian who seemed to be close to him also died. But Beerus was surprised in Chapter 9, when the Celestial Mage who went to Earth after Ub revealed himself to be Taron. But in the chapter it was revealed that Anzen and the other Guardian next to him are also Celestial Mages. One is Odisu and the other is Zorki. This can only mean that the Celestial Mages actually somehow stole the Celestial Guardian's appearance or their body. That is, Taron is not a traitor god. What happened is that apparently another mage whose name has not yet been revealed stole his appearance or body. This explains other things being said by celestial mages for some time in the story, such as Brajan's constant complaints about her gross appearance, criticizing her body, and that also explains Tyra's complaints in Chapter 9 about her body limiting herself in fighting. So we can conclude that the appearances we are seeing of the celestial mages are not their real appearance, but the appearance of the celestial guardians who were killed during the event that happened at the beginning of Chapter 1. Well, I thought it would be nice to explain this because maybe many of you don't remember the last chapter so well, and there are always those who watch the video without watching the previous videos. I would like you to comment on this video what you thought of chapter 14. Did you think it was good? Too violent? Confused? Please give your opinions and criticisms because it's very important for us to improve more and more. Also comment your doubts and criticisms about Dragon Ball Hakai in general. There is a great chance that your comment will be answered in our next videos. Today I end here guys. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel as we become 150,000 subscribers. Until the next time, goodbye.